today, Matthew S. Makeley, PhD, is a professor in the Department of History at Metropolitan State University of Denver. His areas of expertise include modern U.S. history, U.S. history, U.S. West, indigenous history, and Native American history. Matthew has been teaching at MSU Denver for over 10 years and also taught courses at Arizona State University while earning his doctorate. He received his doctorate and master's in history, specializing in Native American history and the history of the American West from California State University, oh, from, and, and of the American West, is from California State University and a bachelor in history from Humboldt University. He has also authored and co-authored several books and also assisted in the production of a short documentary about an iris farm and its relationship with water in Boulder, Colorado called Long's Gardens. And I believe I know which garden that is. So please welcome Dr. Matthew Makeley and enjoy your presentation. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you to um, Kavod for, for inviting me and Temple Emmanuel for sponsoring. The title for today's talk, I've, I've borrowed from my mentor, um, Peter Iverson at Arizona State University, an unbelievably gracious man um, who unfortunately passed away um, last spring. Uh, but he uh, published a book and, and he called it, We Are Still Here. And he's very careful in the introduction to explain he's not including himself among the we because he's not native and I'm not native. So I'm not including myself in that we. Nevertheless, it is important. It was important to Peter and it's important to me to uh, help us understand that native people are still here. Native Americans are still here and that they have um, adapted to survive. And I'm just gonna read just a, a little piece from, from his introduction. And, and here's where Peter was kind of getting at that. He said, Indians are still here. They have contradicted past assumptions that they were vanishing. There are many more American Indians today than there were at the close of the 19th century. Although there has been land loss and loss of language for some groups, there's also been acquisitions and retention of territory and cultural revitalization. And then I'll just finish with this. Um, I, I really like this. Peter's mentor, a man named Robert Burkhofer Jr., who was very well known in American academics, he once observed, quote, we don't consider ourselves to be less American than Abraham Lincoln because we drive automobiles and watch television and Lincoln did not. And yet I think we put an unrealistic expectation on native people. We kind of freeze them in time and imagine if they are not somehow authentically Indian, whatever that means, then they're not really Indian. So when we encounter a lobbyist for a tribe who's on the hill, Capitol Hill daily in a three-piece suit, um, it's important to acknowledge the, the uh, train of events that has led that person to that point and also acknowledge that they have their native identity and their culture um, intact. So with that, I'm going to proceed. Um, let me advance the slides here. Oh, there's the cover of the book. Um, I'm going to start with, and I'm sorry about the image because it is startling. Uh, but, but by 1890, uh, there was widespread belief that Native people were um, disappearing. And, and that's because they were. And in some cases, it was due to horrific violence, as, as was the case um, on the Pine Ridge Reservation at a place called Wounded Knee in the winter of 1890. This is a photograph of the mass burial site following the massacre. It was a long, complicated event. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna go into it today, but just briefly, I will say many, many factors had converged to contribute to this event. One of those being um, the reconstituted 7th Cavalry, which had been uh, George Armstrong Custer's unit, had been called out on patrol uh, because the agent at the reservation at the time was worried that the native people were gathering for an uprising. 
Um, the people who were killed in the massacre were mostly peaceful. It was a lot of elders, a lot of women and children. They were with a group led by a man named Bigfoot. And a lot of people have never heard of Bigfoot. Um, most people have heard of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. Uh, Bigfoot was every bit the leader they were, but he was not a military man. And so we know that the people following him, the kinship groups, the families, uh, were also peaceful for the most part. So this is a tragic massacre that puts a punctuation point on this belief that Native people are going to disappear in the 1890s. And that starts to manifest itself in culture. And so we are looking at an image now uh, by Edward Curtis. Oh, me, yes, Matt? Rebecca, I'm sorry, yeah. That, that's okay, uh, your images aren't coming through. Oh, no, okay, okay. Let me, um, let me think about, so it's still stuck on the introduction slide? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm going to make an adjustment here. Um, let me see. Yes. Still the same? Still the same. I wonder okay. Okay. Um, if anyone wants to chime in there. Oh, there we go. Let's see. Now, now you're seeing it, but it's not in the, the presentation mode, correct? Correct. Right. Well, I hate to do it this way, but in the interest of time, I might just proceed like this because you can see the images now. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for interrupting me. Um, so there's the image I was referring to. Um, I'm sorry that it's not bigger. Let me see if I can make it any bigger for you all. Um, well, we're gonna make do with, with this kind of um, clunkier version. Uh, this is the image from Wounded Knee of the, the mass burial site um, in, in the cold winter of, of 1890. And as I was saying, this belief that Native people were going to disappear um, started to take root in cultural forms. So can you see this image, Rebecca? I see the Edward Curtis. Perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. So this, this is actually a photograph of a Navajo family, um, and they are in Canyon de Chez. And they're riding into, you know, a dark kind of um, future uh, is, is one way to interpret this. And, and actually the person second from last here is, is looking back at Edward, the, the photographer. Um, but Edward uh, Curtis chose to title this image, The Vanishing Race. And he was really representing this view that many Americans held at the time that native people were disappearing. And it was a foregone um, conclusion. And you see that in many, many different arenas of, of Native life. During the late 1800s, um, the, the bison who had, had once um, populated the North American plains in, in um, unbelievable numbers began to um, disappear. And it was a concerted effort on the part of the United States government to eliminate a food source for Plains Indians, but they also wanted to get bison off of the land so that um, farmers could come in and, and put um, those lands to, to seed, to, to begin farming. It had disastrous consequences. Um, the, the Dust Bowl of the 1930s is at least partially um, uh, well, it's, it's, I suppose it's, it's kind of controversial, but I think that the science is, is pretty clear that the, the terrible dust storms of the 1930s, this era that historians refer to as the dirty 30s, were caused by the uprooting of the native prairie grasses, which the bison were, were living on. So there's some startling images and, and numbers. Um, here's, here's probably the most startling image. This is a a mound of bison skulls and, and there's an individual standing on top to give it some scale. Um, gonna bring us closer to home. Any, any questions, Rebecca, or are we? I think we're good for now, unless anybody wants to put something in the chat. Okay, um, your, your hand is still raised, oh, so. Um, let me take that down. Thank you, just mm -hmm. that way, yeah. when you do have a question, I'll, I'll catch it because I don't want to just talk through the questions here. Um, so here's, here's a, a map that uh, demonstrates um, here in Denver, 
how the land that is today Denver and, and much of the Front Range was actually granted by an 1851 treaty to the Cheyenne and Arapaho following the discovery of gold um, near what is today Confluence Park, right by REI. <laughs> Um, a new treaty was negotiated <laughs> because it wasn't going to work for the United States government to have um, Cheyenne and Arapaho people owning the lands where all of this mineral wealth was going to uh, materialize. So the ne renegotiated treaty of 1861 carved the reservation down to look like this. And um, uh, eventually that reservation was also done away with and Cheyenne and Arapahoes were moved to Oklahoma or Wyoming. And, and you can see here this um, designation for the Sand Creek Massacre site, which, which is another um, terrible massacre. It actually preceded uh, the Wounded Knee Massacre. Sand Creek was 1864, uh, a terrible, dreadful event um, that, that really is now very well understood. And, and um, even at the time, the, the United States government and army um, had separate investigations. Congress and the army led two separate investigations into the event. And both of them um, decreed following their investigation that it was a deplorable massacre, unjustified, unnecessary. Uh, let's turn our attention to the Utes who many people um, associate with, with Colorado and rightfully so. Um, the, the Ute people were part of a Numic um, expansion, and, and you can see on the map here, the Numic language family includes uh, Paiutes, Shoshone, and Utes. So at some point, they, they probably were part of a larger tribe uh, or community that over many generations migrated. And, and one of the interesting things I learned when I was working on my book is that the Numic people kind of followed the growth of the pinyon pine trees. And when pinyon pine trees began to colonize the Great Basin and move north, the Numic people kind of went with it. And we think it was probably about 4,000 years ago, maybe 6,000 years ago that the Numic people began their migrations. Uh, and, and the Utes developed a deep association with, with Colorado and, and uh, a reverence and love for this place that they have called home for many, many hundreds and thousands of years. Unfortunately for them, they found themselves smack in the middle of this gold rush and the frenzied environment that created, like many tribal communities, they were pushed to the fringes. There were moments of violence and, and massacres. This is a map that demonstrates the expanse of the Ute um, communities. Uh, the green dotted line uh, signifies kind of their larger territorial expanse for, for hunting, for gathering, for trade, uh, but the red dashed line uh, represents their kind of nuclear lands where, where their communities lived. And there were several Ute communities. Today, um, there are two Ute reservations in Southern Colorado on the, on the border. Um, there's the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation with its capital of Toyok, which sits just on the other side of Mesa Verde. Uh, and then there's the Southern Ute Reservation, which many people are also familiar with down outside of Durango. Utes were, were moved. Um, obviously, this is kind of what the land looked like in terms of where they were living before Americans arrived. And then gradually Americans pushed them to the Western third of the state. And then following uh, the 1879 Meeker massacre, um, the Utes were, uh, basically removed from Colorado. Treaties were negotiated to uh, move them out except for these very small um, reserved lands down here. And this is important for us because what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, water and, and use, uh, use of, of water today as an example of the larger theme for this talk, we are still here the adaptation, the growth, the evolution of, of um, indigenous peoples, in this case, the Utes, uh, as they struggle to survive in a homeland that has been uh, overrun with a foreign nation. So I'm gonna pause for questions and then we're gonna jump into a little bit of uh, background on, on water law, just to get ourselves prepared to understand 
uh, what happens with Ute water. So Western water law um, is different from, from Eastern water law. Uh, and I'm speaking of North America. Uh, much of the Eastern world gets enough rain and has enough surface water so that they can operate under a form of law that's called uh, riparian water law, which, which basically holds that if, if your property touches water, you have some right to that water. It has to be today litigated and negotiated and it's obviously complicated, um, but that doesn't work in the West because oftentimes you need water where there isn't any water. And so people are having to move it and build dams and, and, and use pumps. And, and of course, we're a great example of that, Denver, right? We get a, a lion's share of, of our water from the Colorado River, which, which has to be stored in, in uh, you know, a reservoir and then pumped um, through a series of tunnels and, and um, engineering feats that are really marvelous to the front range. Uh, and so very early on in Colorado, it became clear that riparian water rights were not going to work. There was uh, a lot of violence. Water was needed um, for, for the mining process, particularly um, stamping or, or uh, milling the ore uh, to, to wash the sands and, and uh, to drive the mechanizations that, that essentially separated the, the precious metals like silver and gold from the earth. You needed lots of water. And uh, so gradually a principle emerged kind of organically among the diggings. This is where we first see evidence of this concept of prior appropriation, which held whoever was there first had a senior right to the water. They, they had the most um, powerful claim legally to that water. And this was tested in court and eventually went to the Colorado Supreme Court. And it was codified in, in law in Colorado. And, and then it spread much of the American West, almost all of the American West operates under this principle of prior appropriation. And this diagram here kind of helps us understand how you would think someone living upstream, in this case, a junior water user would have rights to this water that they're very close to. Um, and, and they'd be able to draw water um, essentially at, at need. Um, but if you have a senior water user whose right goes back in this case, 60 years before this one, this user has to get their water before the junior user. That's the basic gist of it. It's um, first in time, first in right. We really saw this play out in, in uh, a place that was called Union Colony and, and then eventually became Greeley. The farmers who had established Greeley uh, went into a, a period of drought in, I believe it was the 1890s, and their crops weren't getting any water and, and they were wondering where all the water was on the Poudre River. Well, a group of people had broken off from the original colony and set up farms higher up the Poudre River Canyon and they were drawing that water and you can see how the Union Colony would be affected uh, adversely. And, and therefore, they had to establish their claim that we were here first, we have a right to that water. So in, in times when not everyone's going to get their water, we get ours first. Any questions about prior appropriation? It works pretty well. Um, it, it, it is, there are, there are nuances and, and it's, it's really complicated. Uh, one of the principles is that the water has to be used for the benefit of um, society to some degree. Now, how we define what a benefit is, is it recreation and opportunities like kayaking and, and fly fishing? Is it farming? Is it mining? Is it municipal use? Those are questions that, um, you know, today we, we have to litigate and put into the, the various water courts. And um, it's, it's incredibly complicated. There is a good book. Uh, it's called uh, Colorado Water Law for Non-Lawyers. Uh, I recommend that book um, highly because it, it, it gives you enough of a working knowledge of water without getting so far into the legal weeds. Okay. With this understanding of prior appropriation, I want to talk about um, what happens as it relates to native people. And it's, to me, it's, it's really in, incredible. 
And it begins with a case in Montana on the Fort Belknap Reservation where you have um, Grovant and Assiniboine um, natives. And here's, here's another way of looking at the reservation on the map. You can see this Milk River here. Well, the Fort Belknap Reservation had been established in the late 1880s, 1888. And um, they were farming. That, that was part of what the federal government wanted native people to do on reservations was to um, become farmers and, and learn how to, to farm. And, and there was a certain irony to that because many native people said, well, we've been farming for thousands of years and doing quite well. Um, if you look at the Missouri River, um, there were communities, the Hidatsa, the Mandan and Arikaras, um, although we don't talk about them often, uh, they had been farming Missouri River bottomlands for thousands of years before Americans arrived. But the federal government by the 1880s and the early 1900s had an agenda of assimilating Native people. They wanted to um, turn them into Americans. Um, and, and boy, I should have put some images in here of the boarding schools. You may have heard of, of the Indian boarding schools. Um, the first was established in, in the 1870s in Pennsylvania at a place called Carlisle. And, and then they spread very quickly. And these were schools where Indian children were taken and they really were kept um, as, as um, students at the school year round and, and often were not allowed to go home. They weren't uh, granted visits from family because the priority was for the schools to strip these native uh, students of their quote unquote Indianness. And so their, their hair would be cut, their clothes would be burned, they'd be given new names. There's stories about children arriving at the school and a teacher handing them a stick and sending them to the blackboard and with a list of names and saying, now go point to, to one of those and that's your new name. Um, and the schools operated vigorously from the 1880s up through the 1930s, at which point the United States government reassessed the schools and said, boy, these are, these are making more problems than solutions. Um, so this assimilative agenda included this desire to turn Native people to farming and ranching. And so that was happening on the Fort Belknap Reservation. However, farmers um, who were downstream from the reservation were frustrated that they weren't getting their water uh, for their farming operations. And one guy in particular, a guy named Henry uh, Winters, went to court and, and uh, said that he was going to, um, now, now I'm trying to remember if it was Henry Winters, but anyway, it doesn't so much matter for us right now. But the, the point is an American farmer went to court and uh, challenged the right of the natives on the Fort Belknap Reservation to take water. And when it went all the way to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court started thinking about this law of prior appropriation, which was in effect in, in the West. And they said, well, if the native people living on this reservation have a treaty, which they did, and in that treaty, we have specified that they're being given this reserved land to become farmers, and, and it did, the, reserve, uh, the treaty did, then there is an implied right to the water in that treaty. And because the treaty goes back to 1888, that means that the Grovant and Assiniboines living on the Fort Belknap Reservation have a senior claim to the water. They were there before the American farmers in these small towns, which means they get the senior rights on that water. Okay, let's pause there for a moment and uh, take questions or comments. We have one comment from Jerry who says that she's been uh, to the museum in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Oh, uh, was that, was that, uh, what was that like? I'd be interested to hear. Eye opening. I grew up in the East, um, not from Pennsylvania, but from New York. Um, and these were, th this was something that was just not part of what we were taught in history. Um, but what she, as you 
said, I mean, new names, uh, new dresses, new, new clothing, hair was cut. Um, you look at it now and go, oh my God, how, how terrible. Yes, that, that, from what I gather, it's, it's a powerful experience at, I have not been to Carlisle, um, but um, there are, you know, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of call an audible here to use a football term. Um, I'm going to find some pictures for us. If, if you just give me a moment here um, that I think would be um, really helpful as, as we think about this is a, this is a lesson I do for my, my classes um, on, on the 1880s when we're talking about assimilation of native people. And I wanted to share a, a few of these pictures. Can you see that now, Rebecca? It should say assimilation. No, we still have the prior appropriations. Okay, so. okay. So maybe maybe this will be more complicated than I, I thought. Um, you know, I can, I can chime in and say that PBS recently had a program on the Carlisle School and the recent um, tribes who are trying to bring the buried remains of the students back to their homes. Um, and it was pretty, uh, pretty traumatic. Yes. I, Go ahead. Uh, we had visited um, the where were we? Santa, Santa Fe Santa. area, and we went to a museum where we also learned this for the first time: how children were taken from their families. And um, it was. Oh, I mean, I was an elementary school teacher. Never taught any of this. Never learned any of this. And I was just, we were just heart amazed and upset about it. I don't know, it's a great um, museum if anyone could get there. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, are you seeing a map now with? Yes. Okay, okay. This is a map of the boarding schools. You can see Carlisle was the first here. And the founder of Carlisle was this man, Richard Henry Pratt. And he had actually gone to the federal government and, and said, listen, the wars against native people are expensive. Uh, we're losing lots of lives and they're unnecessary. We don't need to fight that way anymore. If you give me students, I will turn them into Americans. And he said, I will actually kill the Indian, but save the man. This is an actual quote from Richard Henry Pratt. And here's an image of uh, one of the first classes in front of one of the buildings at, at Carlisle. And uh, Pratt was very fond of these before and after photos. So here you see Cheyenne um, young boys arriving at the school. And here they are, uh, you know, several weeks or, or a month later. And Pratt kept massive files of these photographs because he used these as evidence when he would go to Congress for appropriation for the schools, evidence that his um, plan was, was working. And so the schools spread very quickly and they were clustered in places we might expect on the plains where you had a lot of um, violent encounters between Americans and native people down in what had been Indian territory and eventually became Oklahoma uh, because the, uh, a number of Southeastern native people were removed and put in, in Oklahoma, including the Cherokees. Their, their trail of tears was their journey out of Georgia and into Oklahoma. Uh, and then in the West and, and down at Santa Fe, and it sounds like one of our um, um, community members here has, has been to that school um, in Santa Fe. And often the schools, they tried to take children um, far away from their homes. So I did a lot of research at this school here in Carson City, Nevada, the Carson Indian School. Uh, and I found that there were a lot of Navajo students and that was deliberate because the administrators thought if you get them away from home and, and, and um, separate from their family, you have a better time assimilating them. And I found these really interesting letters. I was researching at the Federal Archives in San Francisco, and I was in a folder on um, the Carson Indian School. And there's this letter from um, a parent addressed to the superintendent of the Carson School. And the parent writes, some time ago, I sent a letter to my son, uh, namely Pedro Cordova, an inmate of your institution. That's an interesting choice of words. Um, the letter was returned to me through the dead letter office marked deceased. Does that mean that my son is dead? Oh. I am greatly shocked and grieved by this solemn matter. And I would greatly appreciate an answer from you as to the cause and particulars if my fears are true. So I am anxiously awaiting your reply. 
And obviously that was upsetting to find this letter as I was doing this research. I thought about my own sons and, and what a tragedy this would be. And about 20 minutes later, I found the response in a different, I, it may have been a different folder. I, I don't remember, but um, the superintendent wrote back, dear Miss Cordova, and actually the person who had written was, was a man I learned later. But um, in reply to your letter, I regret to state Pedro died at the school October 8, 1919. And, and he goes on to say, I talked to his brother, um, Manuel, and, and I thought he would tell you. I thought for sure he, he would tell you. And, and Pedro had not been well. Uh, he'd been sick for quite a while. You can see that in this paragraph down here. Uh, but I use that as an example to teach my students um, the control that the schools exercise over their students and actually the families of the students. I won't get into this one, but there's another letter. This one's from a little girl. She was part of what was called an outing program where they took students from the school and placed them with American families where they lived as domestic servants. Um, the school got money. How much of that money made it to the actual student is unclear. I, I don't think any or, or much. Uh, but this student asked if she could go home for the summer. She's writing from Oakland and, and her people were um, near Carson City. And the superintendent wrote back and said, uh, no, you know, you, you can't go home this summer, but maybe next summer. Um, I think it's best for you to remain here. Um, anyway, this this is um, all a way of kind of um, thinking about how Native people were were being assimilated during this this period. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this one and go back to, sorry to be <laughs> moving in and out of presentations here. Um, so back to our story. Yeah, go ahead. Rebecca. Looks like Margo has raised her hand. Margo, do you want to unmute and ask a question? I actually worked with the Navajo and uh, Hopis uh, in Arizona and the, uh, answer, the Utes at Mesa Verde. And the boarding schools was very sensitive to the descendants even. They just, it was a big disaster. And they remember their parents being quarantined. And inmate is a very good term because it just, it literally stripped all the identity off of the native people. And they weren't allowed to speak the language or anything and yeah that's that's exactly right um, and I'm, I'm glad you kind of brought us back to that for a moment so that i can underscore um Mar margo is it margo yes yeah yes. just to underscore what margo is saying it, it was a tragedy and there's still trauma today um among families black. <laughs> they you know were um taught to not respect their own culture. The teachers told them, your people are dirty, your people um, are backwards. Uh, often religion was a component of the training and they were taught that you know, their, their pagan practices, their, their um, way of worshiping was, was wrong mm -hmm. and unhealthy. Uh, and, and it had lasting effects over many generations. Still today, uh, you know, my, my wife's family in, in North Dakota, uh, her, her grandmother is um, native and, and uh, she, she denies it. She, you know, she won't acknowledge it and they don't even talk about it. If you bring it up, uh, they get offended and, and they say, no, we're French or, or um, Norwegian, but definitely not native. Um, so yeah, Margo, that's the lasting uh, implications are, are still reverberating with us and and more and more work is being done on this you if on your own if you just search like um youtube there there is a video on youtube called um our spirits don't speak english anymore at least it used to be there uh and i i didn't look into the copyright issue so maybe it was violating a copyright and it's no longer there but if it is there that's a good one because they interview a lot of survivors from the boarding schools uh, who talk about their experience so I'm, I wanna be mindful of our time and leave time at the end for us to chat. So I'm gonna kind of quickly come back to this, this topic dealing with water. Um, I actually really love what came to be called the Winter's Doctrine because it's, one, it's a case where Indians win in court. It doesn't happen very often in, in, in US history, 
but this is an example of the Supreme Court acknowledging that if a tribal community has a treaty and in that treaty they are being instructed to take to farming or ranching, um, then they have an implied water right that is going to be respected under the rule of prior appropriation as a senior water right, almost always. There's a really fun novel, although in certain places it gets kind of graphic. I assigned it to my students years ago before reading it. Um, <laughs> and I was reading some like pretty intimate parts. I was like, oh, I should have thought about that first. But um, it's called The Water Knife. And it's written by a Coloradan and it's about the future of water. And it's kind of this dystopian imagining about what happens when we start to fight over water in the West. Uh, and I loved it because by the end of the novel, I hope I don't give too much away in case you wanna read it. Um, but by the end of the novel, these detectives who were called water knives were trying to hunt down um, Indian water rights, trying to get their hands on some of these very old Indian water rights. And it, it was a really creative way to kind of think about that in a fictional setting. Anyway, um, now with the Winters Doctrine and the application of prior appropriation, Native people are entitled to water. And, and that's going to be the case in Colorado, beginning, in, well, for a very long time, Utes have been putting forward that argument. Their attorneys, their, their general counsel, uh, and their tribal counsel have been making the case for their access to water. And uh, finally, uh, the, the, they won in, in um, Congress at the federal level with what came to be called the uh, Ute Indian Water Rights Settlement Act or Public Law 100-585, originally passed in 1988. And it, it was subsequently changed and amended and added to, uh, uh, and, and then eventually the Animus La Plata project, uh, even though the ruling was made in 88, it took 20 years before all of the interested parties who have a vested interest in water near Durango until they could all kind of hammer out the details on how this is gonna work. Um, once it was clear, the Animus La Plata project uh, began carving up some of the water uh, in, in and outside of Durango. And then the Ridges Basin Dam was constructed and once constructed, water was held behind that dam and it was um, named Lake Nighthorse. And it's named after um, Senator Nighthorse Campbell, a very interesting figure who served in the House of Representatives and then um, a long term in the United States Senate. And I had this in my notes down here, uh, you know, he actually switched parties from, from Democrat to Republican in, in 95. Um, and he's, uh, he's still alive. Um, and I believe he has a jewelry store in Durango. Has anyone been to his store? I have not. I have not, but I can say many years ago, I did uh, work in a uh, Southwestern art gallery and you know, we did so much of his jewelry and on the occasion he would come in. So it was pretty substantial pieces with uh, a lot of history. Yeah, it, seems, it looks like we have another comment or question. Yes, Christy. Please. Oh, it's just saying, um, I used to work for another nonprofit and Senator Nighthorse Campbell, um, it was working with at-risk youth and he was very soft towards that cause. And he helped us uh, secure a building to, uh, as a headquarters for our nonprofit. Um, I think he did it in like maybe even kind of a shady way. <laughs> But they talked to him later and he goes, man, I wish I had done even more. I mean, he was just really a champion for the cause. So he was a, a great guy. So it was fun to meet him and really helped us out in the nonprofit world. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an example, you know, uh, of, of um, you know, a, a really successful legislative career uh, for for a Native person. And, and um, I think we've had two or three Native um, American senators in the history of the United States. And he certainly was the most successful. You know, he's, um, I've noted here that he passed more public laws than any individual in the 106th Congress. He also was a judo champion who had served in the pre-war and, and an artist, a very interesting guy. Um, so I think, you know, the name is appropriately placed here for, for this lake. Um, here's, here's kind of um, 
what it looks like on the map. You can see we're in the Four Corners region, which is south of Durango. And here is where the lake sits. Here's the dam. And what's happened now is that um, Utes are a very powerful force in the world of water in this region. This water they can use for um, municipal purposes, they can use it uh, for uh, agriculture. Uh, but one of the things I believe the, the subsequent settlement specified was that they can also um, sell uh, some of the water or lease use of the water to municipalities. So Durango likely will be, you know, having to ask Utes for water at some point, which I think is just this incredible historic irony um, that that Native people, uh, and, and I think it's actually appropriate that they will be stewarding this, this resource for us. Um, when there was that just terrible uh, mine spill, oh goodness, 2000 and you know, several years ago, I don't remember the exact year, um, the spill that just, just polluted um, the Los Animas River uh, terribly. Kenny Frost, who, who is um, a, a significant member of the Southern Ute community, he's thought of as, as a leader and, and a spiritual leader. Um, this is an image taken from the Denver Post when he was offering a cleansing or a blessing for the water. And, and in the interview for that piece, he said, <clears throat> water is life, water is sacred. And that kind of set me thinking about water and the way that we interact with water. And it's one of the reasons now that I, I like to teach water classes because I like to challenge my students to think about um, A, where our water comes from, B, how do we get the water to our taps, and, and C, what does it mean to us? So I um, intended to kind of um, leave it here and move into a, a conversation if, if that's what people want. Sure, but I, have a, I have a comment here from Pam. For many years now, there have been predictions that water is the new oil meaning it is a finite resource that is becoming more and more scarce. In our current drought conditions, we are seeing more and more fighting over water rights. The most recent example is the current fight between Nebraska and Colorado. Yes, yes, that's, yes, exactly correct. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's really grim when we, we face this, you know, I have so much respect for the scientists and, and the attorneys and community members. Um, you know, Colorado, there's a lot to be concerned about with water, but one of the things I admire about all these people working in the field is they've set up working groups in each of the water districts. And these groups will include recreational users, fly fishermen, kayakers, yes. native people, um, uh, legislators, uh, and, and they're talking and they don't often agree, but at least they're in the same room because we know now that there will be curtailment on the Colorado River. Part, part of the problem with the Colorado River is um, when they allocated, they, they basically split the river into two basins, an upper and a lower, mm. and they put each state that contributed water to the Colorado in either the upper or lower and they gave um, a certain amount of acre feet of water to each basin. But when they measured the, the, the flow in 1922, when this agreement was being negotiated, it was a high water year. And they didn't know that at the time. And so they uh, allocated all this water and come to find out years later, that was a, a, an above average year. And there's no way we can actually deliver that much water to each of the basins. And of course, 40 million people are dependent on the Colorado River today. Um, much of uh, California, Southern California's uh, farmland is, is watered by the Colorado River, by a canal uh, connecting the Colorado River to the Imperial Valley. Um, and so we are headed for, for trouble. And people are aware of it and, and they're talking and negotiating and litigating like this recent case on, on the South Platte where Nebraska is basically going to activate their rights to the South Platte and challenge Colorado. A good book I can recommend um, because it's kind of a fun book to read. 
the Emerald Mile, mm. the epic story of the fastest ride in history through the heart of the Grand Canyon. It's by um, Kevin Fadarko. <laughs> and he writes about a flood in, I think it was 1983, when the dams on the Colorado River um, were, were really in danger of being breached um, because there was the Colorado is going to do what it wants. It's been carving its bed for millions of years. And we have it tamed at the moment. <laughs> We've put it to work. Uh, but it is going to eventually find a way around the dam. Um, and so he, he sets, he sets the, the stage by telling the story of a guy who gets in a wooden boat and rides the flood. <laughs> but, but he tells the history of the rivers going back to John Wesley Powell, the Civil War veteran who was the first to journey down the Colorado River, which that story is incredible. He was missing an arm at the elbow had been blown off in the Civil War. And he led, I think, seven wooden boats down the Colorado River before any other um, non-Native person had done that. Yeah, we have one more question here from James. Um, how is this drought affecting water situations for, very, for the various tribes? Yes, uh, good question. And uh, similar to all of our agricultural users in, in the West, it's been devastating. Um, and and the, the, the spill uh, in Los Animas that, that eventually worked its way into Navajo lands was absolutely devastating on top of already difficult conditions with the drought. And so uh, a number of Reservations have done some innovative things in, in the arena of renewable resources, water, excuse me, um, wind and, and, and solar. Um, and then others have created, um, you know, farming enterprises that are really successful. Like um, in Arizona, there is a, a community that um, has their senior water rights and they've created a, a farm and I, I can't remember what they farm, but I know that they are one of the biggest providers of that particular crop in the United States. Uh, and they are right now having to go into court and, and litigate because they are not getting the water they need because of the drought. And um, it takes years to get these issues addressed. And so if a person doesn't want to play by the rules and they have the ability to divert the water to their own property, they're doing that. And especially when native interests are involved because they've just been consist consistently disrespected. Uh, and, and so it is un unfortunately very common for their rights to be challenged or, or not recognized if uh, that's possible in a given area. Yeah, 